I'm not a hi-fi snob because I can enjoy cheaper gear almost as much as pricier gear. And it's all about the music. And I hate all these people that say online that because some gear costs a lot less, it's really inferior. What do they call it? Lo-fi or mid-fi? Even sometimes when it's $20,000 or £20,000 systems, it's just totally ridiculous. The thing is though, even people spending decent sums have the last laugh over the snob who thinks you have to spend over 50 grand to get the best hi-fi and everything else is inferior. That's because of the law of diminishing returns as you spend more and more. And I'm not pointing this out to disparage people spending decent sums on hi-fi as I have myself. It's just that I think value is a consideration in rating best hi-fi. Because I'm not an overly techy audiophile, I largely base my reviews off what I experience, which is true in this best of list. There's so much extrapolation based on tech to decide what's best or good. And this isn't my approach uh, in this pursuit of reviewing hi-fi. One distributor actually told me recently that a customer wouldn't buy a product because it didn't have a certain capacitor. So I'm going to call this the number one eardrum approach. God forbid the real world. So do you use your number one eardrum? So this best of 2020 I've reviewed places really good consumer driven audio file hi-fi first, if I can call it that. No snobbishness, excessive technicality or reliance on tech to rate gear. I've considered these wide appeal type products first that I've assessed on performance against price and relative to the competition that I've tried. By the nature of best of lists, some are lower down, but let's be clear, this doesn't make them poor quality. So none of the, you know, what that's like, only at number five type comments. This is also a list based on gear I've reviewed and tested at home too. It's an enthusiast list. I'm not being paid any money to do this and I will be waxing lyrical. So from 10 to one, here we go. Because these speakers are a lot of money and you don't necessarily have to spend this much to get great audio, it means these PMCs go down to number 10. But this doesn't mean the 2523i are not a fantastic product if you're prepared to spend your cash. The i in this variant stands for improved, not i for injection of 90s boy racer Fords, but it's more expensive than the previous model which I actually own. These new versions best the 2523s all day long on all out dispersion. Build quality is good and that really low distorting character from the transmission line design is also a big star on the PMC's waiter rating badge. This baby Hegel is one of the newer integrated amps this Norwegian hi-fi firm, hailing from Oslo, have brought out. The H120 is very analogue sounding with its Sound Engine 2 Class AB hybrid technology, which means instruments are elevated dynamically, also with a big sound stage. Going from a grand to two grand on an amp might be a big step up for some, but you can tell this Hegel has it over amplifiers I've reviewed at half the money like the Cyrus 1 Cast or Marantz PM7000N, as you might expect. The Hegel's position at number 9 is in no way to suggest this is a poor product. The NAD M10 does make a case for being more user friendly and with form factor too, so whilst personally I'd buy the H120 over the M10, on consideration of Sonics alone for a full rack system, I'm not so sure if I wanted a second smaller system or all the things making the NAD great.
Hegel's Mohican is expensive at £3,900, but as its film namesake suggests, if you want one last premium CD player before new CD production goes tits up, possibly in the next few years, this Hegel might be it for you. This Hegel performs because of its DAC and implementation, and one reason why CD players might have it over similarly priced streamers. I liked it for its open mid-range naturalness, which pulls loads of detail from the recording. Tonally it's bang on too, and bass is very on point. From memory, I actually thought the Hegel Mohican sounded as good as the audio achievable from a similarly priced Chord Hugo TT2, but direct comparisons would be needed to give a definitive view. I bought one of these amplifiers myself because it eviscerates the competition at a similar price from brands like Cyrus Audio or Name. This is Scandinavian minimalist design for sure that would fit in a Scandinavian log cabin with a grass roof or a Victorian house in England with an orangery. But it's about the number one eardrum in this pursuit and this is why you buy the H390. Terrific at driving speakers, no tonal padding in sound and low distortion and high damping factor. It only actually goes down the list because it costs $6,000, so no slate on its terrific capabilities. Hegel are currently working on room readiness for all their new integrated amplifiers. As soon as that happens, any lack of inbuilt streaming app interface will be of no consequence to competition like the Blue OS capable NAD Masters M33 for serious audio files using Rune servers. This is the last in this list of three Hegel products I reviewed in 2020, which happened to be all together. It's really easy to use, isn't complicated, and it will suit everyone. And if this were a list of no holds barred, premium audio file priced hi-fi at relatively sensible prices, this Hegel would be at number one in the list. Okay, it's been out for a while, but this is the first time I reviewed it in 2020, and it's probably still the go-to streamer at price, and crucially above price when you compare what it does to some pricier streamers, like the Aralic Aries G1. If you look at Facebook groups, whenever anyone mentions what streamer should I get, it keeps coming up at price and beyond it. The Blue OS app is on par with apps from Sonos or Yamaha. Add in MQA, an acceptable DAC, and even features like live MQA streaming, as well as being a rune ready endpoint. And it's not hard to see why this product is so popular. For me, it trumps streamers like the Allo Digi One Signature or Sonos Port on ease of use with similar equitable sound quality. One thing that stood out for me was that. What Hi-Fi had it being, I quote, not out of place at price when used in their reference system of ATC speakers. I can understand why this is so because this streamer definitely makes a case of why spend more on streaming transports and opposing this misconceived idea in digital audio of junk in, junk out. I just don't think that mantra can apply to good quality digital audio like this blue sound anymore. Okay, the new XM4s have come out, but the changes are relatively small on all accounts. The XM3s are far from the best detail-wise at their price, but their ability to shut your environment up is extremely musically cosseting. So any traveller should have a pair and the perfect antidote to an annoying business type discussion on a train. You know that one that you have to listen in to.
Hello? No, I'm on the train. Another big plus of these headphones is that the Sony app is great and so is Sony's LDAC Bluetooth codec. I use mine a lot in 2020. And if you're a work commuter too, buy these at a snip for what they do. Notions of hi-fi snobbery that I raised would no doubt be levelled at speakers like these. What? Only a thousand pounds, you say? Pfft, it can't be any good. But the last laugh is on the snob really because of what these kefs give per dollar, pound, euro, yen, Hong Kong dollar, Singapore dollar, Thai bar, Aussie dollar. Okay, I got a bit carried away there, but these KEFs give similar levels to the active model on some accounts, and contrary to views, actives always means best. I've had mine for about a month or two, and to say that audiophile hi-fi can be enjoyed at modest prices counters Mr. Snob here. The same chap perhaps who pulled me up on saying, the proof is in the pudding, not the more British, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Well anyway, I just think that's being pedantics. Okay, there is more to sound than outright bass, scale and soundstage. And even though these kefs are diminutive on price, relative bass performance and sound staging scale, they have nuanced detail in bucket loads, dynamics, demarcated fore and aft depth and incredible bass treble balance. It makes them extremely musical which, by the way, isn't a dirty word in why we do this. I'm going to be using mine to partner with similarly expensive gear I review in 2021, and I'd say their performance at price is the reason I purchased myself. So it may be cliché to say that these kefs must be the speakers to beat at price, but I reviewed the neat IOTA Alphas last year, and I think these kefs are the more rounded speaker to suit neutral tastes. All other brands must listen to what these do and work out why they are so good and why they are so good for the money. As people are saying on YouTube, when can we expect other CAF speakers to adopt the meta treatment? Well, hopefully very soon. The reason LSX trumps the metas is because of price and my consumer audiophile mantra as I explained. I did have some connectivity issues with the LSX which I hope Kef have sorted, but if you were to ever recommend a champion product for those who've stayed away from audiophile hi-fi, like visiting a care home in 2020, brackets regrettably, then this futuristic looking speaker is it. All the separation that two channel audio brings above and beyond speakers like Sonos's Play, but with further generation Uni-Q drivers, Kef's patented mid and bass driver coupled with the tweeter. Uni-Q does work well and the sound is all about trademark detail which is balanced and not in your face, as well as more layering than a Walls Vionetta factory. Add streaming on top and a great price which isn't excessive, this is why these Kefs are at number three a product on the list of anyone considering consumer audio products at the price. Called this RME a cutest killer, which seemed to spawn lots of people saying the same online or hinting at the same. But it's so true on account of feature set, sonic quality, connections, and a manual you have to study like operating a fighter aircraft. But only if you want to. You can just get in this F-16 fighter of a DAC 
and fly it like a Cessna with relative abandon to operation. But for all it does against the cutest, where it hangs its hat is its price to performance ratio. Okay, well, unusually for a review, I'm gonna say it straight away. This DAC punches well above its weight. One of the things that... We often see this where pro audio meets audiophile hi-fi because of the relative capitalization of these different markets. I think this product will easily appeal sonically to just as many people as the cord with taste and preference in the mix. Anyone who says this isn't more than the equal of the cutest, assuaging personal sonic preferences is for me telling porkies. There is no blurring of relative objective comparable performance levels here where it so obviously is a better product and where to say otherwise is to devalue my credibility. This is a total cracker of a DAC and it deserves anyone's attention at this price. Also a la Monty Python, it foot squashes the cord with its parametric equalizer to adjust room response. It's got tone controls, a lovely color display and two sets of headphone outputs, including an IEM output. Also, it's a balanced DAC. At number one, this is a pretty emphatic winner. I've only had this product a short time, but I've made my mind up. Plus, in the UK, I've seen some selling for a little less than the recommended retail price. This is number one for a combination of all-out features, principally Dirac and Blue OS, plus its small form factor, high power class D amplification, and ease of use with its touchscreen to boot. What I did find is that it drives small speakers like the KEF LS50 Metas, which are of low sensitivity and do dip low in their loading. But this is the type of hi-fi component that you'd advocate to someone who wants to start on a journey of audiophile hi-fi. The Dirac is definitely a big bonus of the M10 and like its bigger sibling, the M33, it uses it too. And it accounts for tightening up a bass response and if you're using this amp with lots of bass traps in your room, like big TVs, also Dirac adds depth to speakers and creates very lifelike decay in live music. I call the M10 a pocket rocket for these reasons. An okay $2,500 or £2,200 is an investment to someone not into hi-fi, but when you consider all it does, it is worth it. And this is why this product is at number one. I've no experience of whether it improves sonically on a name Unity Atom, which appears better built in terms of the materials used. But certainly with Dirac and the known effects of a room, even if the name competes equally or better on sound quality, with room correction in the mix, I'd have doubts as to whether it would compare. We know this because of how important the room is in the mix of sound quality. I guess it too depends upon how you rate looks and build and whether you can be bothered to set Dirac up. 